Uh, if you guys could find your seats. Uh, I want to tell you that I want to tell you some bad news and some good news. We are all sinners. We sin more than we ever could comprehend, uh, and we need a Savior. But you have a great Savior who has reconciled you to God, who has forgiven you for every sin by faith. And so it is Him that we praise this morning. All right, let's stand and we will sing together, Immortal Invisible. know the songs well enough to be able to look at you guys, but man, I don't know that one well enough, so uh, sorry about that. We're going to have our scripture reading uh, this morning, and I will make an announcement about that in just a minute, but Jed is coming with our psalm for this morning. I'll be reading from Psalm 26, 6 through 12. I wash my hands in innocence, and go around your altar, O Lord proclaiming thanksgiving aloud and telling all your wondrous deeds. O Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Do not sweep my soul away with sinners, nor my life with bloodthirsty men, in whose hands are evil devices, and whose right hands are full of bribes. But as for me, I shall walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be gracious to me. My foot stands on level ground. In the great assembly, I will bless the Lord. All right, and that's what we want to continue to do in the Great Assembly, uh, which is the greatest assembly that we have had uh, in the last several weeks. So thank you for being here. We will bless the Lord. So let's sing, Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me. Oh, 
be seated. Uh, let me give you a couple of announcements and then we'll have our time of prayer and then learn a new song together. Hopefully, uh, those of you who checked our Facebook page were able to at least familiarize yourself a little bit with that song. Uh, a couple things going on. Number one, thank you for being here. Uh, and uh, we think, think this is about the most we have had since the beginning of March. So uh, grateful to have all uh, uh, most of our summer church family here. And hopefully our Igigik and Whittier people are able to watch. Uh, I know the ones in Igigik have had internet service so far. That may change. Uh, but we're sending um, little USB drives with two services apiece down to Igigik for Tim and Nancy because they don't have quite the service that the ones on the other side of the river do. So thanks for helping with that. And I, I keep getting emails and things from people who are watching from across the United States uh, not that there's anything special about what we're doing, but we're glad that we can bless them. So thank you for um, being patient with uh, us as we've tried to figure out our YouTube channel. Uh, I did want to mention that uh, for our scripture reading, if any of you men or teenage boys would like to participate in our scripture reading on Sundays, just let me know, okay? Okay. Um, so I'm putting it on you to let me know if you're interested rather than me pursuing you, okay? So uh, if you don't want to just continue to see me and Jed up here, um, let me know if you would like to participate in that, and we would appreciate that. I think uh, everyone knows that we're not doing passing around the plate as far as offering, so that is out on the back, and uh, you can uh, give uh, as God leads you to do that. And then also... 
related to that, next week is communion. And just out of trying to make the best decisions, we will continue to not pass the plate during communion. So like we did a couple of weeks ago, we'll have individual things of crackers and then also individual grape juice bottles out for our families to collect. If you want to bring your own, you can. We'll also have uh, plenty of cups that you can grab as families so that you're prepared for that. I'll put them out a few days in advance just uh, because of transmission, things like that. So that will be next Sunday. So Barbara, you don't have to worry about that on Saturday. Uh, and then um, I believe that's it for announcements. I thought there was something else, but oh yes, yeah, Sunday school. <laughs> uh, we are doing Sunday school today uh, in the church building. Now, if you would rather not stay for Sunday school for whatever reason, uh, the adult Sunday school material is in the fellowship room. If you want to grab that and take it home, then Michael has already sent the material for uh, our kids' Sunday school. Uh, so we will be making sure that we're doing all the correct things as far as social distancing, all these new words that we've learned in the last several weeks. Uh, and uh, that is our plan for today, and we'll see how it goes. Okay, so thank you for that. Uh, one prayer request, Elaine contacted Ann, I believe it was yesterday, and said that they have a raft that uh, they use to go from their house out to their boat, which I guess is in the river, and apparently a brown bear got a hold of the raft. So uh, it's essential for them to use that, and uh, they're trying to figure out whether it can be repaired or what they're going to do. So be praying for Dale to have wisdom, especially with that. So let's go together now to God as our church body, and then we will learn this new song. Father, we come to you today, and uh, we are just so incredibly grateful for the, the week that you have given us. It's flown by like most other weeks. Uh, we've done our normal things, and we sometimes don't even have our radar on our radar the fact that you care for us in so many ways. You've cared for our souls. The fact that we are not in hell right now at this very moment is only because of your faithfulness, that you are faithful to your covenant, that you're filled with mercy and filled with love, and you have sent your Son to accomplish our salvation you have regenerated our hearts, and you have held us. We have not been the ones to hold on to our salvation. You have held us safely in your hands this last week as you continue to do faithfully. So thank you for the assurance that we can have that no one will ever pluck us out, Jesus, of your hands, and no one, as you said in John 10, will pluck us out of your Father's hands. And nothing can separate us from the love, Father, that we have from you in our Lord and Savior. So we rejoice in that, even though we sometimes just go days and days without thinking about the depth and the magnitude of what it means that we are safe and we are at rest. And we have been brought into the holy places and we are dearly loved because Jesus paid the penalty for our sins and he ever lives to make intercession for us as he's risen from the dead and is our great high priest. We just are so grateful for that, and we're so grateful for all of the things that flow out of that that we've experienced this week, relationships, and uh, your sustaining power as we have gone through difficulties, and material goods in this, this great and beautiful state in which we live, and rain, and uh, health, and a, a country, or at least so far we can be free to worship, and just on and on and on, the depth of the blessing you've given us. We are very grateful for that. May we never stop being still and being grateful. Uh, we also know that this week we have sinned, and so we corporately confess those sins, sins that have been in our thoughts that no one else knows about, sins that we have committed against others, that maybe even as you forgive us, we need to go to those individuals and ask for forgiveness. Sins of things that we should have done and didn't, and things that we shouldn't have done and did do. 
So we just ask for forgiveness for those, and we're very grateful that you are always ready to forgive and make our relationship with you what it should be. Uh, so thank you that we can live in that reality. We want to pray for our country. I pray especially just for the continued animosity that is being displayed uh, from people that may be on different sides of the political spectrum and just all of the different elements and details and implications of what's going on in our country. I pray for healing. We ultimately know that that healing will never come through Donald Trump or any other individual. It will only ultimately come through Jesus. And so I pray, Jesus, that you will uh, make what is going on in our country within your sovereign purposes a platform for the gospel to go forth. I pray that we will realize that even in our community that is maybe insulated from some of the things that are going on in the lower 48, that we will realize that the gospel that you have given us is the only answer for those who have dark hearts. And I pray that we will be bold and be given opportunities and make opportunities to give that gospel to those who need it. Uh, I pray for the coronavirus uh, situation in our nation and across the world, that you will uh, keep people from getting it and keep people who have underlying issues from dying. And may we be wise and loving as we navigate what's going on uh, in our community, in our state. I pray for leaders as they make decisions, people who are flying, just all of the different details there. We do want to continue to pray for our church family uh, who's here. Thank you for the ones who are here today. And I also pray for the ones who are gone for the summer. Pray for Perry and Lois that you will uh, help uh, their business as uh, it's different with not as many tourists. And I pray that you'll just sustain them. I pray for all of our fishermen as the salmon have started to come in. pray especially for Dale and Lane that you will give them wisdom as they try to figure out what to do with their boat that's been attacked by the brown bear. And I thank you that we can, um, again, bring our sacrifice of praise today. Thank you that we don't have to sacrifice a lamb or a bull or a goat on an altar, that that's already been done. It was final. The great sacrifice has been made so that the sacrifices we make reflect that, but are from hearts that are filled with thanksgiving for who you are and what you've done. So may that be on our hearts in these next moments. In your precious Son's name, amen. All right, uh, this is a song that I... Uh, did anybody have a chance to see this on our YouTube or our Facebook page? Okay, so one of you. So it's going to be totally new. Uh, we are going to learn it. Uh, it's uh, a song that uh, actually is taken from, I believe, the Heidelberg Catechism, uh, What is Our Only Hope in Life and Death? It is that we belong in our bodies and souls to Jesus, and so it's taken from that. So we'll sing it now, and then we'll also sing it after the sermon. So you can go ahead and remain seated as we learn this together, and uh, hopefully you can pick up on it. Thank you. 
together with us, and uh, we will again, as I said, sing it after our sermon time. You can turn to Hebrews chapter 13. We're going to be in verses 13 through 16. As we come to the end of Hebrews, the response of worship to the magnitude of the superiority of Christ continues, and that is what verses 13 through 16 demonstrate. So if you found Hebrews 13, 13 through 16, could you please stand with me as we honor God's Word together. Let your eyes go to Hebrews 13, 13. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Please be seated and let's pray together. Father, in these next moments, I ask that your grace through your Holy Spirit, through whom you have inspired your word, will be very evident uh, to change our hearts to again, as we always ask, fix our eyes on the greatness and the goodness of Your Son, what He's accomplished for us and His infinite superiority, the better altar He's given, so that we respond and we reflect in worship. Thank You, Jesus, that You are infinitely worthy of that response and that reflection. In Your name, Amen. By a show of hands... How many of you have been to Denali National Park? Okay, good. The majority of us. If you haven't, please go. It is one of the great demonstrations in all of the world, in my opinion, of the greatness and magnitude of God's creative artistry. 
you can get on Yelp. Probably some of you don't know what Yelp is. It is a website on which you leave reviews of things. So it can be a restaurant or a store or a national park. And it is fascinating to look at the one-star reviews on Yelp of national parks. So you can, for instance, see what a dissatisfied person said about the hole in the ground in Arizona. Or, uh, and we've been there, and I mean, you can't not look at the Grand Canyon and just be in awe of God's, again, creativity. Or uh, Yosemite. Uh, now, we have been to Yosemite, and I probably would not give it a five-star. I'd give it a five-star review on God's part, but I probably would not give it a five-star review on the trillions of people that are there with you. Uh, but, you know, I've been to probably a dozen national parks, Grand Canyon, Yosemite, Kings Canyon, Sequoia, Rocky Mountains, the Smoky Mountains, Bryce, Zion, and then Denali. And... Uh, there are a couple things, notwithstanding the dissatisfied customers and their one-star Yelp reviews that I've noticed about those places. You know that I am, I'm not sure what kind of photographer you would call me, but I take pictures. And when I go to those places, particularly Denali, because it's in our state, I usually try to go about once a year, there are a couple things that are true. Number one, there is a response to the magnitude of the greatness. At least if you're like me and you're a nature lover. You can't not be in awe at the wonder. And it doesn't have to be a national park. It can be, you know, something even around here. I was talking to one of our families about brand new little one, brand new little baby Loon. Okay, so you can't not be responsive to what you have experienced and observed. So that's a response. And then I also believe, at least in my case, and then even in the case of people who have their camera phones, there's a reflection. As a matter of fact, that's exactly what my camera does. It's got a mirror inside it that reflects the image onto a little digital sensor, and then you've got a picture because of a reflection. So there's a response. I am in awe of what I've observed, and then at least in my case, there's a reflection. I reflect what I have observed and put it on Facebook or whatever. I think that interestingly parallels what we experience and what's demonstrated in these verses about the magnitude of the superiority of Christ, which is what all of Hebrews has been about, of the fact that God has, has given us this better kingdom, which is at the end of Hebrews chapter 12, and then the response is to be worshipful. The author says it himself. And then especially this better altar that God has given us, through His Son, this altar in which we feast on, in which we're, we're, we're sustained by Christ in contrast to those, great, the, those high priests on, on the Day of Atonement who did not get sustained by the sacrifice. All of those things produce an overflow of response, that's worship, and then reflection. So, in our observations today, we're going to, under each observation, talk about what the response is and talk about what the reflection is, and I hope that will help us have a handle on the text. And again, as I said, this gets back into responses of worship. Because of Jesus' better altar giving, which was the last text, and His fully sustaining sacrifice, we go to Him in this text outside the camp we all, so that's the first thing we do. So the author tells us to do three things. In response to the better altar giving, we go to him outside the camp, we offer up sacrifices of praise, and we do good and share. And the basis, as I said, of this is a build-up. 
There's the superiority of Jesus. I mean, if you haven't caught anything out of Hebrews, hopefully you've caught that Jesus is infinitely superior. There's chapter 12, verse 28, so you can actually let your eyes go down there because I think it is really important for chapter 13. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship, which I think chapter 13 is all about. So if we've received this greater kingdom because of the superiority of Christ, then our response is responsive and reflective worship. And then the last part of the buildup is our previous text, the better altar and the fact that Jesus suffered outside the gate or the camp. Because Jesus fully sanctifies and sustains us, that's where we were last week, through the better altar, He is provided by His suffering outside the camp. We have every reason in an overflow of worship for lives of responsive and reflective worship. Now, again, I want to explain, this is why I started with the the illustration I did, what responsive and reflective means. Responsive is worship rooted in gratitude for Jesus' person and work. He's infinitely superior. He's given us a greater kingdom that can't be shaken. He's given us this greater altar through which He wholly sustains us. And so then we respond with every facet of our being being worshipful. And then reflective is this, and I think there's an interesting nuance, and it's in the text. The gospel is the basis for that worship. We identify with Him. We're united to Him, particularly as the better altar sustains us, and He sustains us perfectly. So then, therefore, our doing, and there are three things that we do in this text, Right? We go to Him outside the camp. We offer up sacrifices of praise and we do good and share. But our doing is based in His done. And there is the reflection. Let's first of all look at the first thing that the author tells us to do in response to the better altar. That is this, in verses 13 and 14, we identify with Jesus outside the camp. Now, the author shifts the analogy of outside the camp. In the previous text, if you remember from last week, he said that rather than like when the bull and the goat were, all, or were, all, were sacrificed on the Day of Atonement, and then the high priest took the blood into the most holy place, but then that body was taken outside the camp and sacrificed so the priest didn't get to eat it. Remember, we talked about that last week. Jesus was sacrificed outside the gates of Jerusalem, outside the camp, and we do get to eat of that. So that was the analogy that the author used. But here he kind of shifts our perspective on the analogy, and he says now we abandon everything that's inside the camp and we go outside the camp to him. We find our satisfaction in that reality that he suffered outside the camp and we identify with him and then the the verses say we suffer on his behalf as those who are like him deemed outside. Oh, how how amazingly appropriate that something was written 2,000 years ago about bearing the reproach of being considered outside the camp how appropriate that is in 2020. Verse 13 then, Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, in verse 14, but we seek the city that's to come. This is responsive as we see his surpassing value and abandon all else in comparison to loving him. Just like you observe whatever it is that you observe. You know, I was talking about national parks, but whether it's a beautiful piece of music or whether, you know, you're into art and you go, I assume there's an art gallery in in Anchorage. Uh, There are some pictures on display at the Kenai Welcome Center, so you could even go there. And you look at beauty, you look at something of great value, and you respond. Well, infinitely greater than that is the one who has the most value, and so... This is responsive as we see that surpassing value and abandon all else in comparison to loving 
Him. And I just want to say to you, the author of Hebrews has done a better job at revealing the superiority of Christ than I have done in preaching it. His words were inspired. But I hope that over the last year or whatever that your affections have been lifted to the revelation of how infinitely beautiful and satisfying your great high priest is as he's better than Moses, better than the law, better than the old covenant, better than the angels, better than anything. To see the magnitude of what Jesus has accomplished is to see him as surpassingly valuable and be compelled to go, as the verse says, to him. Psalm 17, 5 or 15 echoes that. When I awake, the psalmist says, I shall be satisfied with your likeness. Isn't it amazing that the psalmist uses the word likeness? And we know that the very likeness, as Hebrews chapter 1 tells us, of God Himself is His Son. And that is rooted in the fact that His Son did not just come merely to give us an example and to do a bunch of miracles, but His Son came because we are sinners and we deserve eternal damnation in hell under God's wrath because we've sinned against His holy standard against His law. But in God's mercy, He sent His Son to accomplish every facet of law-keeping and then bear the penalty for non-law keepers and rise from the dead and intercede on the behalf of those who would put their faith in Him and what He's done. So that's the gospel for those who maybe in our room who assume the gospel or it's never clicked or maybe even someone who's watching to see that magnitude. You can't help but run to Him outside the camp. And Jesus being crucified outside Jerusalem signifies His rejection by all that Jerusalem represented. Boy, you see that a lot in the Gospels, don't you? That everything that Jerusalem represented, those who found their identity in the law, in doing, they're the ones who rejected Him and sent Him in God's sovereignty outside the camp where He would suffer. So, we therefore then gladly renounce all else and hope in and treasure nothing but Him. Now contextually, this would be being given to individuals who may be looking back at Jerusalem and thinking to themselves, it's going to be a lot easier with me or for me if I just go back to that, I'll stop suffering persecution. But the implications are exhaustive for us. We look at everything else and we see it as insignificant in comparison to the surpassing significance of the one who's outside the camp. The Jews thought of the camp, so it uses different words in our previous text, right? Camp and gate, but it's saying the same thing. The Jews thought of the camp or Jerusalem and all that was in it as sacred and everything outside as unclean. In Jesus, it's reversed. What was formerly sacred is now meaningless. You can't get anything of lasting value inside the camp, the author says. And if you try, you're hopeless. But outside the camp, which removes every bit of every type of work or self-righteousness because outside the camp I'm clinging only to the hope of Jesus is where the only hope is. What was formerly sacred is now meaningless as Jesus was expelled from it and all it represented. And for us, this is not trying to find our security or our identity in something easier or more appealing to our own self-righteousness or our flesh, but temporal and unsatisfying. So here's maybe the, the application for your life. You know, contextually, again, it was the Jews abandoning everything inside the camp and the law and the Old Covenant. But what is it that you must look at and say insignificant? Could be things, 
could be relationships. For most of us, it is still thinking there is something I have to do to make it that God loves me more. Offering my own self-righteousness is, self-righteousness is up. So my plea to you today is you identify the, ins- to, to maybe stretch the context a little bit, as you identify the things that are inside the camp that you let go of all of them and run to the one in His surpassing value and His work in person. So that's how it's responsive. But then here's how it's reflective. We consider Him worth any reproach we will endure. And that's specifically what verse 13 says. Because if you go to Jesus outside the camp, that means that you're also going to suffer the reproach from the world that He did. Now, in his case, it was the Jews and the Romans. For us, we know in 2020 what it is. I mean, just look at Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or anything where a person tries to take a stance for Christ, especially when it comes to some of the hot-button issues like LGBTQ and abortion. 1 Peter 4.14, Peter says it, in the same way that the author of Hebrews says it. If you're insulted for the name of Christ, you're blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. So to go to Him in that context originally 2,000 years ago would be to identify with the one that Judaism deemed cursed and unclean and condemned. And you can imagine, put yourself in their place. I mean, that's a big deal. I mean, we think sometimes, you know, like of Muslims now who who trust Christ as Savior and how that is such a huge step. And then especially when they're baptized, you know, when they're totally cut off from their families. And then in places like Nigeria, I mean, if you're a Christian, you're murdered. So we even know kind of some of the context of, a big, of, of how big of a deal that would be. But for Jews, it would be a huge deal to go to relinquish everything about who you are ethnically and abandon it all for the one outside the camp. And again, how true that is today in our context. We've banked everything on the rejected one. And verse 14 indicates why we identify with and suffer for Him. Our hope is is in something that is beyond what is here. We, we look to the city that's to come because here we have no lasting city. We don't have a Jerusalem. They didn't either. And we don't. We are outsiders. Boy, do you not know this now. We are outsiders in this world. For our citizens, citizenship is somewhere and with someone infinitely better. Philippians 3 says that in verse 20. Our citizenship is in heaven. From from it we await Jesus who will change our bodies. And so here's how this is reflective as we go to Jesus outside the camp. We participate in, in a small way, His reproach. Not always easy. Sometimes we're scared of evangelizing or saying what has always been truth in the face of a postmodern world who says there is no truth or has redefined truth. But to see the surpassing value of Jesus and to go to Him outside the camp is to gladly, through the power of the Spirit, though it might ultimately kill you, be willing to bear the reproach that He endured outside the camp. So are you there? Do you see the one who stands outside the camp and bore this reproach as as a partner? As the one with whom you will identify because of his surpassing value? And those things that we would choose that make us think it's not worth it, in the blink of an eye, they're going to be gone. And you will see that it wasn't. 
So we identify with Jesus outside the camp. And let's not be ashamed of that. You know, I, I know that we are not kind of on the front lines of where some of our other brothers and sisters are in the lower 48 and in other places where they really are having to, you know, risk being shut down because of the crowds that are around them in the big cities and things like that that are saying, you're intolerant, you're bigoted. I know that we're not on those front lines because of our community. But whatever it looks like, even in Nikiski, let us be willing to take a stand against this culture, though we love the people who are in this culture, with the one who's outside the culture. Secondly, in verse 15, we offer up a sacrifice of praise. Now, this reiterates the entire theme of worshipful response that chapter 12, verse 28 said, I think, kind of flows into chapter 13. And it ties also to the sacrifice that Jesus made on the better altar. So what Jesus did outside the camp was he sacrificed. Now, he sacrificed himself, but it was reflective of every sacrifice that happened before that. All of those were anticipating the ultimate sacrifice. Again, we don't have to kill anything. We don't have to sacrifice a bull or a goat or a lamb or a pigeon or whatever. Because the sacrifice has been done, but there is a sacrifice in which we participate. And the verse makes that very clear. It's a sacrifice of praise. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Now, I believe that this is obviously primarily talking about words coming out of your mouth that respond to the magnitude of the greatness of Jesus. But again, it's, it's more comprehensive than just that. So it's not less than that, but it is also more than that. And this is responsive as the magnitude of the gospel compels hearts of praise. Oh, you've seen that and, and you feel that and you know it, don't you? When you think about the greatness of what it means that God has taken a dead heart and brought it to life. That you will never, if you've trusted Christ, suffer a split second of God's wrath because Jesus paid it all. That he... The breath came back into life of the one who was dead in a tomb. And you've been brought to life. And you will be reunited with your body in the end because Jesus forever has a spirit and a resurrected body. And you're dearly loved. You're invited to the throne of grace. You're forgiven for all of your sins. I could go on and on. You've been given the Holy Spirit. That's the, those are elements of the gospel. And when we think of that magnitude, boy, could, how could we not just, both in lips, but then also lives, be responsive in worship? Now we do this, the verse says, verse 15, through Him, which is being shaped by the gospel and relying on Him in the context of what the previous verses said, this better altar that we've been given that sustains us. Galatians chapter 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ, but it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. And then the author says, continually. This is every facet of life on and on. And so that's why, again, I said it's not less than singing. And so I will say those who have been impacted by the magnitude of the gospel will be singers. I mean, I, 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 I think I can say that biblically. That doesn't mean we have a good voice, but it does mean that the overflow of response to glorious gospel truths is song. It's amazing to me sometimes, I'll just say this kind of out of my own personal perspective, that uh, people can go to a, you know, a concert and sing their hearts out and not be the ones who could be so impacted by the gospel that it comes out in lips, like the verse says. So it's not less than that, but it's also more than that. It's not just singing, it's giving. It's loving. It's loving your spouse. It's submitting to your parents. 
It's shepherding your kids like God shepherds us. It's evangelizing. It's not sinning. And so rather than those being a moral checklist that I do so that God likes me more, it ends up just being an overflow of response, which frees me. The sacrifice of praise is verbalizing His glory, but it's so much more. And then, here's how it's reflective. Again, think of you know me taking a picture and reflecting something that was a, a reality. This is reflective, just like it's just like Old Testament worshipful sacrifices anticip- anticipated the ultimate one. Our praise rehearses it. Okay, so there's an ultimate sacrifice. Jesus made it to pay the penalty for our sins, and every Old Testament sacrifice anticipated it. And it was a sacrifice of thanksgiving in the Old Testament. It was, it was praise. Now, it could be done out of a heart that wasn't praise, and we won't get into that, but it was meant to be worshipful. It was meant to be praise, among other things. Our sacrifice is not an animal. It's a sacrifice of praise, and rather than anticipating the ultimate one, it points back to it. So this idea of a sacrifice of praise, a psalm call, the psalms call it sacrifices of thanksgiving. It's found several times in those psalms. Here, as I said, it's not the sacrifice of an animal, but it's praise coming from our mouths and our lives. So every facet of worshipful response echoes the gospel. For if every sacrifice of thanksgiving in the Old Testament, Old Testament anticipated the gospel, I think what the author is saying here is he's saying, do what they did, because they had a heart of faith that was underneath the sacrifices, or they, they were supposed to. Do what they did, but you're not, again, killing animals. Your sacrifice is praise. Again, out of lips, but out of every facet of life. And as you are doing that, you are echoing the greater sacrifice. They anticipated it, we echo it. And because it's connected to the sacrifice that He made, the better altar, last week's text, we're reflecting it, though obviously it goes without saying, in small part. So this should thrill you, that as I'm going through my life and just doing my, you know, everyday things, eating and working and recreating and all of the things I do, it is an opportunity as I am giving this sacrifice of praise out of my voice on a Sunday, but then all of the comprehensiveness of life. As I'm worshiping in overflow and this sacrifice of praise is coming out of my, of my mouth and my, my hands and everything else. It's rehearsing the greater sacrifice. So you you have opportunity when you are so thrilled with the one who's outside the camp and you've gone to him, you have opportunity to reflect who he is and what he's done. Last, in verse 16, we live holy and loving lives and are generous. Gospel and Christ-enabled, holy, loving, living, and generosity mark those who have, benef- been, who have benefited from the better altar. Verse 16 says, Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. This is responsive as obedience, love, and generosity flow from worship, gratitude, and who we are in Jesus. Now, I think when it says do good, it's... It could be taken a couple ways, like doing good things for people because it's talking about sharing what you have, being generous, generous. but also doing good, there's just the basic level of, of living a holy life, of honoring Him. And so it's responsive because we've received the better altar. He sustains us. It's His power. We've gone to Him outside the camp and we cling to Him. Our identity is in Him. We're, we're, we're in Him. And so the doing good, whether it's doing good to and for others or just living a 
life that honors God is rooted in Him and it flows from Him. And again, these are under the category of worship and sacrifice. So, an individual who is rooted in moralism and self-righteousness can do Christian things. And an individual who is so captivated by the glories of Jesus, who responds in worship, can be doing the very same things, and it can look the same, but it's coming from different wells that are diametrically opposed to each other. And as we actively and selflessly serve others, so doing good for them, and then also sharing what we have, being generous, it again, it's just responding. It's responding. And there are some interesting practical implications that you could gather out of this. If I am one who is so impacted by the gospel, what does this look like for me to be generous to others, to share what I have. It certainly doesn't mean we become a socialistic nation or church, but it does mean that we hold very loosely to the things that God has given us because someone, someone He has given us could benefit. And it might, might be material things, it might be money, it might be food for someone who's sick. It could be a variety of things. It could also just be simply ourselves. Because we have that and we can share it. So it's responsive. And then here's how it's reflective. It echoes how loving and giving God is to us. And in small part, our sacrifices like Jesus's please God. Loving and sharing reflects the gospel. For God has done that infinitely for us. Well, he's a giver, is he not? He had something, had someone, and he loved us enough to not hoard him to himself. He gave him. That's what the most famous verse in the Bible says, does it not? God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And as we respond to gospel truths by being giving, by being generous, by sharing what we have, we're reflecting who God is. The idea of sacrifice is again mentioned in the verse, and I find this just simply breathtaking. Because Jesus pleased His Father. Now, He was the only one who perfectly pleased Him. All of His life... I mean, really, when Jesus said that the greatest commandment is loving the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength, I mean, how many of us do that nonstop, right? We have maybe little blips, but it was never like Jesus and how He pleased His Father. And then also, His sacrifice pleased the Father. And because He pleased Him, we too can with these sacrifices, though even when we do them, they're never offered with the perfection that Jesus offered them. But I mean, that's what the verse says, right? For such sacrifices are pleasing to God. You actually can please God. That seems preposterous to say, because I know how sinful I am, but the author said it. That's rooted in the one who has pleased his Father, but since the Father loves the Son and accepts Him in His generosity and in His condescension, He is pleased with my sacrifices of generosity and doing good for others. Doing good and sharing what we have reflects the gospel. And it's done, as verse 15 said, through Him. To bring God joy is very motivating. I mean, have you ever experienced that fact when, when, when you're, you know, sacrificing, worshiping all those things and you're bringing God joy, which the Bible says can and does happen, and you're miserable, right? No, you're not. When you bring God joy, you're joyful. And He has the best taste. He loves what is good. And so, again, it should blow your mind 
that these things that we offer, these sacrifices of praise, this generosity, all these things that we do so imperfectly can please the one who has the best taste. For it is because of His condescending mercy and His Son in whom we do everything pleasing to Him. For if we were not in Jesus, these meager attempts at sacrifices of praise and generosity, they'd be worthless. They'd be filthy rags. But in Jesus, they're loved by God. And it makes a reality. <clears throat> you guys know that I like uh, John Denver. I have been made fun of a lot for liking John Denver. I grew up with him. My parents bought me his records. I actually still have some of those original records. And um, he really taught me how to play guitar. You know, I'd, I'd put cassette tapes in and listen to his songs. And I'd, so he was my guitar teacher. So, Seth, anything I've taught you is ultimately because of John Denver. John Denver was a tragic, tragic figure because he looked at everything in this world, and unlike us, he didn't take it to God, and he was hopeless in his worship of nature. And then also he was really tragic in love. Divorce, you know, Annie's song, that beautiful song that was written in the mid-70s, divorced her, married again, divorced her. And he, he sings a lot about losing love and longing for something that will finally satisfy him. And as I was mowing the yard over here yesterday, I was listening to one of those songs, and it almost made me weep that this person whom I respected for the right reasons, he was an ungodly man, but he created content that reflected who God was, even if he wasn't pointing to God and trying to point to God, it almost made me weep that this person was so empty and hopeless and unsatisfied. And so then, therefore, as his plane, unless he had a conversion experience that no one knows about it, his, as his plane went into Monterey Bay and he instantly died, he's suffering under the condemnation of God forever. A life that is hopeless because it can't, it can see all of these things, but it can't comprehend the magnitude of the one who's infinitely valuable. That's not us. For your eyes have been opened, your affections have been attuned to the glories of the superior one who's given an, a better altar. And so, therefore, then, my response. This sacrificing, the sacrifice of relinquishing all else for the surpassing worth of Jesus and going to Him solely is worth it. And it's easy. I mean, I, yeah, I know it's hard because the verse even says we suffer with Him, but oh, it's, I have no other choice. He's so compelling. And this sacrifice of praise in response to who He is and what He's done, and this sacrifice of giving. It's all responsive. Oh, I'm seeing greatness and I'm just responding. And then it's all reflective. And so as we are responding, you have privilege and opportunity to be reflecting in small part the glories of Jesus Himself and what He's done. Let's pray. Father, we want to give these last 41 minutes to You and ask that you will make them lasting beyond 41 minutes. Through your Spirit, for your Son's glory and for our satisfaction. In his name, amen. All right. As I said, we want to uh, practice learning this song again, and how appropriate after this text that... Uh, we sing about Jesus being our only hope. So, in that I, as I said, preached 41 minutes, you probably have forgotten everything about the song. But let's try to sing it again together. Let's stand this time, and this will be our closing song. By the way, before I forget, okay, you can go ahead and stand. But the other announcement that I forgot was, so you can mark this down, I'll be telling you more about it. Bob and Stacy Rawls have decided that on 
July 18th at 1 o'clock. So that's a Saturday, 1 o'clock at their house. They're going to have a funeral memorial service for Duraney. So I know some of you didn't know, know Duraney that well. Uh, some of you did because uh, she had not been around for a while because of her cancer. But we would love to, number one, everyone in the church is invited to participate in that. But number two, even if you would rather not come because you didn't know her, we want to help with food. So uh, I'll be letting you know more about that. I know there are some interesting things going on because of restrictions and suggestions because of COVID-19, but we want to do whatever we can to help Bob and Stacy. So again, I'll be letting you know more about that. wanted to mention that before I forgot. Should have written it down. All right, Christ, our hope in life and death. together. We'll sing it again next week. Uh, take a break. Uh, no donuts right now, but uh, you can take a break and then we will begin Sunday school. Again, if you're not staying, uh, the material for the adults is in the fellowship room if you want to grab it. Okay, we'll see you in a little bit. <laughs>